você precisar a tradução, pode pegar o aparatinho em si. Tá? A gente vai começar em um minuto. Tá? Tá bom? Mas quando eu falei 10 minutos, vou estar tudo... vai ser muito ruim. Tá. Oi, um, oh, hi, my name is Eduardo, Eduardo Silva. It looks like a very Brazilian name. My last name is Silva Pereira, even more. So uh, I'm Chilean, but I live in Costa Rica, and I work for a U.S. company, which is called Treasure Data. Uh, Treasure Data does a lot of uh, fun things. Um, the things more attractive for me is that I work for the open source team. And that is the main reason because I'm here with you guys. So we are happy to join you to stay here in Brazil and check out what the community is doing. We mostly work with, with the term which is called big data. And, and big data, it's about the collection of a lot of information from different sources and the ability to perform some analytics over that information, mostly for your business. You know, you can get a lot of more of revenue if you perform a good analysis and you get good results of your data. So that's why we exist. And this presentation, it's about how you can collect a lot of information from these different inputs or sources or logs and store them in the cloud properly. Well, uh, about me, um, Eduardo, I um, have been doing open source development for a while, long time. I started using Linux in the 99, I think. And that's my contact information, Twitter, blog, and all well, the, the projects that I involved. For Treasure Data, I work in the FluentD team, FluentBit, and I have my own open source project, which is a web server for Linux, which is called Monkey, and a web services framework, which is called Duda. So if at some point you are interested on something of uh, this project, the Fluent family, Monkey do that, let's talk after this presentation. Okay, we're going to talk about logging, what logging means. Uh, for me, logging is in a tour to, if something happens, it's that you create a record of that event, okay? Uh, how many of you are system administrators, just to get a, Please raise your hand. I cannot see your hand, but they turn off the lights. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So you understand the nature of logging. Okay. So most of you have administrated Apache, Nginx, MySQL, MongoDB, and all that fancy tools. But logging has many benefits. For example, uh, you can get the application status. You can perf perform debugging. Sometimes uh, your service crashes. Okay, it crash, you go to the log files, you find the reason, or maybe you don't, and you just restart the service, and that's it, nothing happens. And also, uh, it's very helpful to perform troubleshooting. Uh, I used to work for a really big company where we were, were doing support for enterprise Linux. And we got a lot of customers with uh, kernel crashes, uh, services that are not starting. And sometimes you need to troubleshoot and go around many log files. Not just the system log files, also each service, uh, you need to figure out what's happening with the storage. And sometimes that storage is private. It's not a hard disk, it's not a SATA disk. It's something that a NetApp or something that you need to go into that system and collect the logs. And also, of course, logging is very important because you can do it locally or remotely, which is a very good approach. Now, and why logging matters? Because if you get information, you can get results and perform analytics. For example, uh, if you're doing some mobile applications, you can take that application and see how the user is behaving with that application, what it's doing, where it's clicking. Of course, you, are trying, you try to log that user behavior. And of course, it's for improvements. If you see that the user is not catching up some special feature on that application, you get that information, you say, oh, the user is not smart enough, or I was a bad designer, so I'm going to change how this works. And you can improve it. But and when you do this kind of, when you think about logging, and when you design your architecture, you need to think about logging. But also there's a lot of assumptions. For example, I have enough disk space. 
this will work. It will never be full. Of course, after a few months, you will forget about that, and your disk will full. Something crashes, and you don't, you don't know what happened until your manager come up and say, hey, what happened with this? Uh, I don't know, but it just restarted. Um, you say that, oh, input-output operations, for example, when you write information to a disk, will not fail or will not block. It blocks. Uh, it's very, oh, I'm writing my new Node.js application, and it's pretty fast to write a message to that file. Assumption. The log formats are human readable. I started writing my own PHP Python application. I write my error messages, and somebody starts writing their own error messages, and when something happens, you go to the log files, and you see that everything has a different format, there are missing information, and everything is screwed up. Uh, another one, my log mechanism will scale. My application was used by a hundred of people, and now it's being used by a thousand, two thousand. And what happened? Imagine a hundred of instances writing to the same file, which means you need to log in and other things. You get blocking, you, you, you lose performance. So it's not easy. Of course, if you have a few users, that's fine. But sometimes it's not. So it should work. And what are the major concerns that we have? When the logs increase, your data increase, of course. You need more space. Uh, the message format gets complex. If you design some application one day and the next year you continue improvement, add the new models, new features, you start adding new messages. And those messages are likely to be different, stay in a different format. And well, when I wrote the message, I got an OK. OK, that was fine. But when you write a message, for example, for the file system, you don't go to the file system directly. You go to the kernel buffer, the virtual file system, and then go to the file system implementation, and then it flashes to disk when it can. But something, if something happens in a step before, like an error, you will lose that message. Uh, well, if you have a multi-thread application, and you're writing to just one log, log file, you can screw up the messages. So you need logging for that. And if you have multiple applications, you need multiple logs. OK, so right now we understand that, that logging is a bit complex. And write the right message, messages, messages sorry, is more complex. Again. So if we have multiple applications, we have multiple logs. If we have multiple hosts with multiple applications, it's complex. OK, so we're sure logging matters. It's really beneficial, but it needs to be done right. OK, so if you're, you're starting, this is not the scope for a really small application. For example, my colleague yesterday, John, who's here in the second row, he said, OK, you're creating your new mobile application. You have your cloud service. Everything is working perfectly. You have 50 users. But something happens, and your application got viral. And now you have 1,000, 2,000, or maybe more than 10,000 users in a few days. And the application stopped working. The cloud service stopped working because you did not think before how to improve on that case. When you do login, and you create remote services, you always need to think about how that will scale on the service. It's really important. Uh, and logging has many areas and many contexts and many inputs. For example, if you're logging, you're not just using one service, you're using multiple. So uh, if you have a, many applications with, with logs, for example, web services like Apache, Nginx, or using the system log with syslog, you, you may want to collect all that information. And also, if you have your own custom applications made on different languages, C, Ruby, Python, PHP, Lua, you also need to collect that application information. So if something happens and you want to start reviewing that information, all the logs, how do you do that in an optimal way? Uh, how many of you have tried to parse log files? Please raise your, hand, raise your hand. OK, all of you have used CAD, grep, and all that fancy tools for Unix. And at the end, uh, say, oh, I'm writing my, my good script to parse all of this, and a script that has like 
I don't know how many charters. A lot. But you start losing performance. You say this pipe grab, pipe, 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 pipe. And that means a process plus a process plus a process plus a process. And you have multiple files, it's a mess. So performance matters. Always think that. Everything that you're doing needs to be performant. It does not be too fast, you know, but think about it how to implement it. So uh, this is a problem that uh, we as a company come up with years ago, you know. So the thing is how I can manage to have different log files with different formats and unify that information properly. Okay, because I want to do some troubleshooting, maybe I want to perform analytics over that. So I, I want to talk a, a little bit about FluentD. Do we have some FluentD users here? We have one, really? Please come up after, we have a person for you. We don't have more? Okay, no problem. Because FluentD is uh, born initially in Japan. Uh, how many of you use Logstash? Okay, we need to fix that. <laughs> no, no, sorry, I don't like to blame other projects. But uh, well, FluentD is pretty similar to Logs, what Logstash does, okay? The difference is that FluentD is made in C plus Ruby language. So it has a, a different approach for performance and how to handle the information. Uh, FluentD is an open, it's open source and it basically, it allows you to perform data collection unifying that information for better understanding of that data. So imagine that you get a log file and you use FluentD to convert that entries in the log file to JSON. You say, wow, that, that's better. So what are the highlights of all FluentD? The, the first one is the high performance. It's built with, with built-in reliability. It's failover, so you can put many FluentD instance as you may need. Uh, you can manage your logs in a structured way. So it manage that now your log files in Apache on Nginx, MySQL, or the system logs are transformed to a JSON format. FluentD knows how to do that. So you tell FluentD, please read the log files on this point. This is, uh, for example, it's Apache, please use the Apache plugin. So FluentD knows how are the Apache formats. He goes and take that in a JSON format. Uh, it's a pluggable architecture, and we have more than 300 plugins available. All of this is open source, of course. Sorry? Okay. So this is what we used to have before. You know, if we want to pick, take the, that information just uh, to perform analysis, or if we want to, I don't know, some people love to have their log files in a MongoDB database. Okay, what they do? Well, they write some script on Python or any language, they start processing the log file and store it in the database. That's perfect, it works. Until somebody tells you, okay, now please you do the same for this another application. And you start writing a new script for that, a new script. So if you want to use some uh, remote service as Amazon or some Elasticsearch or Hadoop to perform a uh, map reduce over your data, it was a mess. It was a big, big problem. So FluentD came here to fix this because what FluentD does, it has many inputs, it processes, it buffers, and has many outputs. So this is not about um, how to store the logs in a different way. It's a solution to take your, in your data, your input, and store it in a different way, yeah, right? Because if you want to perform, uh, imagine that you, take, you want to take all your tweets, your tweets on Twitter, okay? You can use FluentD to take that and store all of that in MySQL. Pretty easy because the plugins are there. It's already working. The same thing happens that you can start running FluentD in a cloud service and make your, your mobile application, maybe Android, iOS, and push that information to the cloud and then do whatever you want. This is the common example. We have many users that do this. They have Apache, they use, run many FluentD instances who start processing the logs and push that information out to MongoDB. But there's a good thing about FluentD. FluentD is pretty smart about how it handles the information. 
FluentD aims to do not lose data. So FluentD knows if I got a ton of information here, um, I know where it starts, I know where it ends. And when I flush out the information to the database or to a different place, FluentD knows if it fails or not. If it fails, I will try. It has smart buffering. If it say that, okay, there's a problem with the network, I cannot push out the information, I'm going to store that in the file system until I can. Similar as uh, a database behaves sometimes. Sometimes a query, an insert fails, but you record that information in a file, that instruction in a file. And then you can recover from that state. So FluentD is very smart on that way. It has buffering, plugins, and the good thing is that you can connect many FluentD. So you can make like a routing between many FluentD, things that it's hard to do with another solutions. So uh, this is not a talk about FluentD, but I would like to show you a simple configuration. For example, uh, this is like XML. But look, for example, to the tag source, which is in the top left. It means source, type HTTP. So that means that FluentD will start listening as a web server on the port 8888. That's the input, the source. I will be a web server listening here. OK. And I have another source, which means tail. Tail as a common tail from the command line aims to read the last new information from a file. So please do a tail always over the, the Apache log. The format is Apache plus please add a tag. A tag means that when information is coming up, because you can have many sources, I said, okay, all information that's coming from Apache, I will add a tag. A simple label which say, Apache that access. And then we have another section which say match Apache access. The match means please match the whole records that have this specific tag. On this case, it's Apache access. And what I will do, in, it's like fluently talking, with this information, okay, I did a match with this. And we say, okay, this is a type Mongo, okay. And for a plugin, who resides in FluentD, a type Mongo means I'm going to flush out that information to a MongoDB database. The database name is Apache and the collection log. Collection is like the table name. And we ha you can have many matches and, and do some forwards, as you can see. So this tool is very powerful because it's like a Swiss knife. You can do whatever you want with your information. You're not going to lose information. You can use it for your business, it's open source. So if you want to know more, who's using this in production? I can be talking about anything, yeah? You don't need to believe me. But I will tell you that try to believe to these guys who are using FluentD in production. Line, Slicer, Nintendo, Amazon Web Services, uh, Google Kubernetes start using it. And right now, how many of you use Docker here? Raise your hand. Docker. OK. The good news. Uh, my bad to not add a slide about that right now. But it's like a few days ago. Uh, right now, the Docker version that we have out is a version 1.7, OK? And the good thing is that that version includes a log driver. That means that when you have your container and you are uh, pushing out information, the logs from the Docker container, you can say, OK, I want my, in my output in JSON. I want for syslog format or whatever. Now, our, well, a colleague of us, um, Toru, I think is his name, he made a patch for Docker. So now Docker 1.8 has native support for FluentD. So if you have your Docker working and you're using Docker 1.8, you can specify to use the FluentD driver and you can push all the logs to your FluentD instance. Pretty neat. Okay. And the business reason, who use FluentD a lot? We are using a lot every day. Our company who support all of this development, and this is for, and pay for our trip here, is Treasure Data. And we, with FluentD, we collect 800,000 events per second. Per second, using just FluentD. And 
This happens right now. Every second we are collecting this kind of information. Of course, this is happening from our customers. We have customers from, from gaming, for automotive, for, for, di for different contexts. Okay, so I think that you are a bit aware about FluentD. But logging also happens in other use cases, not just common services. For example, uh, we're talking about more server application. And now we have other things. For example, the famous IoT, which is real, right? Embedded applications and containers. I just talked about that, but let's talk about the Internet of Things. What's the main difference between a common application that runs in a server and something which is under the concept of IoT? IoT specifically means a device that can talk to each other, right? The common approach is that you have a device and talk to a cloud service. IoT devices have the capability to talk to each other, register each other, and expose some features. But you also need login. If you have some medical device, you have some home automation service, you need that. And we know that IoT will grow to billions recently. Um, it needs device-to-device -device connectivity, and we have many frameworks and protocols for IoT. But all of this needs login. It doesn't matter. So uh, I don't know if you have heard about this, but there's a few frameworks for IoT. One of them is IoTivity. The other is all join, and Google come out with so the implementation that is we don't know too much about it, which is Brillo. It was announced a few weeks ago. So how do we approach logging for IoT? We say that, for example, Logstash is a good solution, but it's made on Java. You cannot put a big Java solution on an IoT device. Uh, FluentD is good enough, if we're more lightweight, but it, you will need at least 20 megs for that. So you cannot waste 20 megs on an IoT device, because it's an embedded device, it's really small, unless you have a, a device who has a lot of memory, so, but it's not the case. And embedded. Embedded means embedded device, small devices with restricted resource. Well, IoT works on top of embedded devices. And where we can see embedded things, we can see it on medical device, automotive things, home automation, many things. Now, we come up with this thing. OK, FluentD, it's great, it's awesome. We have thousands of users around the world. Right? So that is very good. It's pretty stable. It's in production. Now everybody's come up with this IoT stuff. So we need some logging. What we can do? So I would like to talk, like to talk about this new open source project, which is called FluentBit. FluentBit, it's like FluentD, but the difference is that it was written from scratch in C language with a different scope. FluentD is more generic to try to solve your business needs. But if we talk about embedded, we talk about IoT, we need something more specialized. FluentBit is that solution. So FluentBit is open source and has been made to collect information from sensors for signal radios, like SAC XB, uh, and also had the features, for example, to get um, metrics, for example, how much CPU the device is using, how much power is using, how much memory is using. And it can be used for also for automotive needs and telematics. So it's lightweight. It has been written in C language. You can customize it, has plugins. And the best thing is, is that you can integrate it with FluentD. What that means, if you have your embedded services, embedded device, and you are collecting information, okay, you say, okay, I'm collecting with FluentD. What I do now, you can push that out to FluentD. And with FluentD, well, to Mongo, Elasticsearch, Treasure Data, or whatever you want. So basically, it's the same philosophy. Inputs, it has outputs, and it uses a binary serialization. Well, I talked that, J um, that FluentD was using JSON, right? But JSON is a format that is expensive to parse. For humans, it's very easily, because you know, oh, this is a tag, this is a map, this is an object, a Boolean, or whatever. But also, I did not mention this, but FluentD integrate a binary version, which is called message pack. Do you know message pack? Raise your hand. One guy, two, okay, we're growing. 
So, <laughs> message pack is an open specification. It's like a JSON, but in binary. Okay? It's pretty fast. It's very optimized. Because when we transfer the information from the customers to the cloud service, we use message pack. You don't want to waste your bandwidth. You want to optimize. We're not going to talk too much about the message pack. We can do it later. So, ah, and FluentBit can talk in, well, it supports configuration files. So, some specific features. It can collect information and distribute. It has built-in metrics. It has a CIPA for developers. Maybe you don't want to use FluentBit directly, but you're writing your own application, and you can hook FluentBit as a library. Right? Pretty neat. So I just write my JSON, and the FluentBit library take care of that and push that information out to FluentD or any service that you prefer. And of course, this is open source, and it's under the Apache license version 2. OK? Feel free to use it to modify it, but let us know. OK, so how this kind of integration works with FluentD? Imagine now that you have uh, this scenario. On one point, you have many data sources. For example, an XB radius. Do you know what an XB is? Raise your hand. OK. XB is a really small device who's like a radio, OK? And that chip, you can ha you have it in the market in many devices, and you can buy one for your computer. So you can use a different radio to transfer information. You can have been using an activity framework. So what you do is run FluentBit in some system that runs Linux, OK? And FluentBit support many kind of inputs. We are working now on activity support. It supports already XB. It supports Linux. So you can collect information on FluentBit and push that out to FluentD, and then FluentD take care of distribute that information to, to your Mongo, to Amazon S3, Elasticsearch, Treasure Data, or anything that you may need. But it also supports a direct output to the storage. That's what we are working right now. So maybe you don't, you don't want to implement FluentD. You just need FluentBit. So you just go directly to the storage service. OK? But it's up to you uh, if your service has a good network connectivity. No? If you don't want to use FluentD, you take some risk right away. Because FluentBit do not aim to store things on the file system. Just buffer memory and try to flush until certain interval of time. So uh, a few examples. OK, I will try something. I have a screenshot of the examples, but let's try something live. If it works, great. Otherwise, we look at the screenshots, right? You know how the, the, the demos live works are a bit complex. OK, uh, give me one second. Oh, this worked. Cool. OK, left pane, right pane. Here, I cannot see anything. Oh. Sorry, let me see what I'm saying. <laughs> I cannot see. It looks like you are not seeing too. Let me try to a mirror here. This place here. OK. This is always a pain. Have Linux running in a Mac. Always. You always get troubles. Uh, where is the mirror option? Can you see that? Where? Down, down. That one? This one? <laughs> Left? Thank you, guys. Where's the apply button? This one? Right. Uh, hey, there we go. Yeah, I can see that. Thank you, guys. This is community, right? Everybody is supporting each other. Can you see my screen or not? Wow, can you see now? 
man, I took like hours to perform this setup, so. <laughs> no, let, let, let me try some white background. Uh, colors. White. Oh! Thank you, guys. Goodbye. <laughs> okay. Okay, Fluent Beat was not made to these colors because the output has colors. <laughs> so let's try. Okay, what I'm going to do here, oh, it's white. Oh, guys. You're joking me here, huh? Uh, no, no, let's, let's do a black one. Oh. Hey, there we go. Trust me. Okay, where we are? Okay, that's fine. Fluent Beat is here. Okay, let's see what Fluent Beat has for us. You can see this, guys. Yeah, you can read that. Okay, we have many inputs and many outputs. So what I'm going to do is just to measure how my CPU is working locally in my computer. Okay, and put, buffer that information and push that out in a JSON format. So basically, I will do something like this. Fluent bit input, CPU, output, standard output. That's right and with some verbose messages, so we can see what's going on. So we can see that it's collecting information every five sec well, every second and flushing out every five. Did you check the output? Let me break it, here. This is, it was original, a message pack message, but it was translated to the standard output. The first field is the timing, the Unix timestamp on where this event was collected. And we get the field and how much CPU I was using. Right? This is just an example. It, maybe you cannot realize how useful it is, but when you are in an IoT environment, it is. Okay? Now, okay, this is working. But let me show you how can integrate this with Fluent B. Fluent D, sorry. Let me. Uh, do, 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 do. do we have enough time, right? How many minutes do we have? Okay, we have enough time. Cool. Okay, Fluent D. Uh, oh, I'm gonna show the configuration of Fluent D. Okay, this is my Fluent D configuration. Pretty simple. Okay, my type of input information is a kind of forward. Okay, that means that it will listen for the forward message format. Will listen on the whole interface address. Don't care about that. And the TCP, TCP port 12.2.2.5. Basically, it will get that information from that port and try to match every information that has the tag Fluent Bit. And what it will do? It will use the standard output plugin. That means that I will push information, it will read it, and push it out, but on the Fluent D side, over the network, of course. Local network. Okay. So let's start the famous Fluent D. Mm -hmm. Let me, you can do it better. Okay, this is Fluent D working and here is listening, right? So what I'm going to do here, instead of push the information to the standard output, I'm going to write it to Fluent D. And it's just simple as this the local, the loopback interface, which port? 12.2.2.5. Oh, verbose messages. We can see what's going on. Let me check if this is working. It's on. A few seconds, it's booting, it's. Okay, so it just starting collecting information, it should work. Okay, don't blame me if you don't. Okay, then you got the information on the Fluent D side. So as you can see, we collect information every time, time, 
and then we flush uh, that out to FluentD. Right now, on FluentD, on the right side, we are pushing that to the standard output, but we can push that information to MongoDB or to a cloud service, whatever you are using. When talking about, when I mention this, it's how important you need to collect information from different sources and the capability that you have to store that everywhere, right? So, okay, let's stop this for a while and let's get back to the presentation. Oh, we have other kind of inputs. As you see, XB, CPU, memory. Oh, and the kernel log messages. Do you know the command DMESG? Do you know that command? Okay, what it does? Quickly. Okay, it got information from the system, right? Basically, it reads information from the kernel log buffer. And we can do the same. We're going to write that to to Fluentd very quickly. Did you check that I changed the input plugin? Okay. Ooh, a lot of information. Well, as you can see, let's try to dissect this. This here. As you can see, this is the tag. Flowing bit, right? That was sent by flowing B, flowing bit, and this is the like the JSON message. So we have the priority of the message, the sequence number, the second time you said, and the message itself. So everything is handled as it, if, if it were JSON, but internally it uses message pack. It's pretty optimized, and we are working on something very cool here with flowing bit. It's on active development. We just started the project two months ago. We also started supporting the serial interface. So if you have some Raspberry Pi or so BeagleBone Black device, you can read information for your serial device. And the standard input, we are working on MQTT support, which is one of the um, well IoT protocols, and we are also adding HTTP support, so Fluentbit can behave as a web server too. And the output that we support Fluentd Treasure data service, of course, and the standard open. So let's back here. There we go. So just a tip, when you make presentations, try to mirror the screens so you don't get that problem. Okay, so we were, sorry about that. A lot of slides, I think. Do, do, do. Okay, features of Fluentbit. I already talked about this, but well, it's open source, made in C, and had 10 minutes, thank you. So Fluentd integration, we were talking about this, direct output, and examples. We already did examples. We did an example for the kernel log messages, which is pretty much what we have there. And the Fluentbit configuration. Uh, Fluentbit use uh, a configuration which is indented. Okay, how many of you use Python? Python, okay. You know that when you write Python code, you need to indent your code. You need to respect how many space you add from left to right. Otherwise, it not work, right? And that was made to the programmers has to have clean code. Okay, we took the same approach, but for configuration files. If your configuration file is not indented, it will not work. So basically, we define sections like TD, which this is an example of the Treasure Data Service. Don't copy my API key, please. Treasure Data Service. Uh, and Treasure Data has many key values. For example, the API code, the database name, and the table where it will store the information. Okay? I'm sorry because of the red color there. But basically, you can add some configuration file if you are, for example, writing your own plugin for Fluentbit and you, you need a configuration file because you need to add a lot of information that your plugin needs, you can use the configuration file system. So our roadmap is continue working in library mode and uh, support a stock of sensors, right? Because this is for embedded and IoT stuff. We're still working on MQTT and HTTP protocol, and we are 
we want to release a version pretty soon, maybe one month, two months. So we are welcoming everybody who wants to join us to contribute to this open source project. If you like the, to program in C or you like to test or make some promotion, you are more than welcome. Please take note of our addresses of the projects. And I always had to mention that we are hiring cool people that who feels motivated about these things that you can send me a Twitter at E-D-S-I-P-E-R at Zipper, Eduardo Silva Pereira, or at my formal email. So that was the presentation. Thanks so much for your time. If you have questions, raise your hand. OK, we have one question right there. It's booting, so, hey. It should be using Windows. Uh, can I speak in Portuguese? Excuse me? Uh, eu posso falar em português? Pode. Ok. Mas devagarinho. Uh, ok. Um, tu falou que vocês têm em torno de 800 mil inscritas por segundo no FluentD. Isso. Uh, eu creio que isso seja um gra e, e gravam isso no banco Mongo, pelo que eu entendi. Não, a gente não usa Mongo. Ah, ok. Mongo Porque é justamente é... O, o que eu ia perguntar é isso gera um grande problema de escrita em algum lugar que vocês vão armazenar isso. Como é que vocês contornaram esse problema de escrita para esse volume tão grande de, de dados que estão entrando? OK. Uh, he's asking, OK, uh, I have the assumption that you are using a MongoDB database. And how do you handle to write that kind of data to the storage? OK. Uh, basically, we don't use Mongo. Because Mongo, uh, I'm sorry, but do not scale as I would like to. OK. For what we do, big data collection, where we handle 800,000 of data per second, Mongo does not work. So we implemented our own kind of um, key value store database, which is called Plasma. It's not open source yet. OK? We have a cluster of FluentD for balance, for failover, and we storage that with our made-in-house implementation. But Mongo, for our case, is, is not working. It never worked. Mongo works until certain level. But after that, you need something more Something different. Uh, if you want, we can talk after the session. John is an expert on that area. He's here. Okay. He gave his talk yesterday, so we can talk more about that. Thanks. More preguntas? La pessoa da atrás. By the way, I have a lot of FluentD stickers that I don't want to take back home. So if you want it, take it. É, bom dia. Bom dia. Eu, é, pelo que eu pude perceber, você analisa os logs que a aplicação está escrevendo para também armazenar. Tem alguma outra forma de interação, por exemplo, você checar se ela está de pé, se a aplicação está de pé, fazer um health check via HTTP, alguma coisa do tipo? É, de novo, mais devagarinho, por favor. Desculpa. Não, não, está é... bem, está bem. Vamos de novo. De novo. É... Você faz, o, a aplicação consegue fazer algum request HTTP para algum endpoint da, da aplicação para saber se ela está de pé, por exemplo, ou se ela tem algum erro sendo alarmado, um, um health check, por exemplo, um serviço de health check da aplicação. Ok, você está perguntando que se eu tenho informação sobre HTTP? É. Ok. If you, uh, if you can make a request, a HTTP request to my application and check if everything is okay or if you have a, a, a 200 uh, status oh. and if you log this kind of uh, message. Ok, você está perguntando, ok, this is different, ok, você quer ir a tua aplicação, fazer uma pergunta na aplicação, tu, como tudo está, eu pegar essa informação para mim. That's it, so the, not, not to check the log file. Ok, ok, uh, FluentD, uh, can I ask for in English? Okay, FluentD has support for plugins. You can make a plugin in Ruby or C, pretty easy. So you can instruct to FluentD to go to your application to certain HTTP interface, REST interface, or whatever, gather that information, and do whatever you want. 
yeah, of course, you can do that. You can tell it, please go every five seconds, every two nanoseconds, or whatever. That works, and many people is doing it. But it mostly do by creating their own plugins, because that is very customizable, because it's just a need. It's a very specific need for something. But I had to share that yesterday I was talking with the main developer of SystemD, and SystemD has, do you know SystemD, right? The new init system for Linux that's been integrated in Fedora and all my distributions. Okay, SystemD has the same. SystemD has an HTTP interface to expose information about the system or the logs, so you get the logs over HTTP. So after a talk that we had yesterday, we, Treasure Data, we are going to start implementing that for system D, which is pretty much similar of what you want to do. And the answer is yes, you can do it, but you had to make it on your own. Okay, thanks. Ginad. ¿Te más preguntas? Aquí tengo una, dos. Ainda tenemos unos minutos. Preguntas, cerveja y caipirinha son bienvenidos. Tools to analyze the data. Okay, um, like what? Okay, he's asking if FluentD has the capability of FluentD to get information and filter that out. To, or to perform some modification? The answer is yes. FluentD allows you to filter the information as you get it in JSON, because FluentD transfers the information to JSON, because maybe you can use a regular expression to mark the fields of your data, okay? You can take that information and you, you may say, okay, you know what, I don't want these three fields in my output. You can drop that inside FluentD. So it has filters, it has regular expressions, so you can do that right away from the configuration. One more? Last chance. Okay. Oh, we have one? No. Okay, if you have more questions, uh, feel free to reach us. We will be here around. So, free talk, like a free beer. So, thank you. I enjoy Fluentee.